So hello everybody, wonderful people out there. This is our 16th webinar and welcome to you all. The time today is a little bit off, so we're not that many people, but I just thought uh, doing this live just adds energy to, the, to these uh, webinars as opposed to doing a recording. And the reason why it's at this time is because we have Christine Houghton with us today and she sits in Brisbane in Australia, very exotic, a place that I, is on my list. Um, so, um, but I'm grateful for all of you, those of you who has been able to clear your calendar and um, yeah, join us. So anyway, I'm Anne Catherine, co-founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life, a group of companies that's eager to change healthcare through functional medicine and personalized medicine thinking. So remember, you have your own practitioner um, profile with us and you can get tests and supplements and for yourself and your patients and your practitioner profile. So um, we are recording. So we are live and recording. And I will share the recordings uh, with you as soon as Zoom allows me to download them and upload them into YouTube. And remember, you can always prescribe, or what is it? Subscribe, not prescribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel where there's yeah, many webinars lying there now. Anyway, the star of today's show is Christine, Dr. Christine Houghton. Um, yeah, she, the first time I met Christine was in South Africa. It was, she did a jaw dropping lecture. <laughs> and then after, and of course it was in Solfora fan. I was impressed. And um, then in the evening we were sitting in this like really like savannah like place, really nice. And it was just really funny. And actually with Christine, it was one of these experiences where like women get together and they get to talk and have a heart on heart. And it was really lovely, Christine. So anyway, she's not just a pretty face. She actually holds a degree in nutrigenomics and biochemistry and human nutrition. And she's founded Cell Logic, um, a company that ma manufactures nutrigenomically active ingredients. And her current interest lies in investigation of phytochemicals that impacts gene expression within the human cells, isn't it cool? But also in relation to gut ecology and immune modulation and cellular defenses. So, and that's what we're gonna dive into today. Sulforaphan is her baby. And she has published several articles and book chapters about this special phytochemical that I actually, during my degree, when I did my uh, um, nutritional medicine degree, um, I, I had an exam paper on, on sulforaphane. So I, I dug a little bit into it. So, so, so it's, but, but nothing, of course, to what Christine can do. But yeah, I can tap in a little bit on it as well. So remember, as always, these webinars is also for you to, to ask questions on the side and communicate with each other and uh, yeah, create community. So again, this uh, united but apart. So anyway, Let's pass the stage on to Christine. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you very much, Anne Catherine, for such a kind introduction. And yes, I do remember that lovely night in South Africa. Here we are on other countries on the other side of the world. If only we get to travel again, life's going to be wonderful. So um, thank you to all of the uh, people who have joined us on this webinar. And yes, you're right, sulforaphane is my baby and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. And um, we're going to do this over two sessions. So I'll show you shortly how we're going to break up that content. Uh, but before I do that, I do have a disclosure. And as Anne Catherine indicated, we do manufacture uh, through our company Cell Logic in Australia, a broccoli sprout raw material that is uh, very potent yielder of sulforaphane. So that's my background, as well as the fact that my PhD thesis was on sulforaphane. Some of the papers that I've published. Now, I thought it might be fun to give you a little bit of background as to how I got to where I am, because the interesting thing for me is if we look at this diagram here, I started practice long before any of the rest of you were even born in 1975. And I started out practicing in an era when there were so few supplements on the market, we had to use food. And um, that was interesting because I, I got to appreciate the real power of food and the things we can do with food. 
And I do think over the subsequent decades, we've lost sight of that to some extent because we have supplements which are so readily available. So if you look at where we are there in 1975, and that was just the beginning of the megavitamin era. So I guess I could say I grew up with that and very quickly there were multiple supplements on the market. And we were being educated by um, the Americans at that time and we followed along with this concept of using high doses of various micronutrients in order to drive enzyme pathways. Now the word nutrigenomics wasn't coined until 2004 so we didn't know that in part that's what we were doing, but we did talk about biochemical individuality and we thought it was wonderful that we are in this era of therapy where we could individualise a patient's therapy in accordance with their particular biochemistry. Sadly though, we didn't actually have any way of measuring any of that, but it really sounded good to say that we're specialising in biochemical individuality. <clears throat> now I stayed in clinical practice for almost 30 years and by the time um, I decided I haven't had enough of being chained to the appointment book, it was 2004 and so I left clinic and that was the very year that the term nutrigenomics was coined. So it was really expedient for me that the time I'd left clinic, not really knowing what I was going to do, I very soon after discovered this wonderful subdiscipline of nutrition science called nutrigenomics. By 2005, I founded the company called Cell Logic <clears throat> because I'd already found a couple of products with nutrigenomic activity. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and, and so by 2007, I'm really focusing now on sulforaphane. I discovered that and we'd um, investigated the process of manufacturing it through 2009. And by 2015, um, I had then come to the stage where we had produced a product which was close to the highest sulforaphane yield of anything in the world. And then by 2016, we knew we had reached that. The interesting thing about this cycle is that I started out with food as almost my only available intervention. And here we are all these years later, and I'm back to looking at the power of food yet again, except that we now have our understanding of food anchored in 21st century science. So, it's a pretty exciting place to be and it's pretty exciting to have gone that full circle. Nutrigenomics, you'll hear me mention that word over and again, and this is not a nutrigenomics seminar, but of course we have to refer to it because a lot of what we're doing with plant-based phytochemicals is altering gene expression. So part of what we're going to do today is to explain how a molecule like sulforaphane has such potent nutrigenomic activity. The way we're going to do this, so tonight's session one, or today for you, perhaps, we're going to talk about the science of antioxidants and, and its evolving conversation. And we're going to then look at cellular defences and the importance of NRF2 signalling. You don't hear me these days talk very much about antioxidants per se. I'm more likely to talk about cellular defences. And as you'll see shortly, we thought that antioxidants were the thing we were striving to, um, to find as supplements and we were striving to provide ourselves with as many antioxidants as possible. But we've had to change our story on that and I'll explain that shortly. We uh, learn a lot of this from lessons in exercise. We'll classify antioxidants to show how they're not all the same and they do fall into various other categories. And then we'll go into looking at what sulforaphane is. In session two then, we're going to talk a lot more about the clinical relevance of molecules and others, other plant-based molecules um, clinically. 
we're going to then look at the world of determining a sulforaphane supplement from the label, and that's very confusing. And then some of the clinical applications we're going to look at is detoxification and estrogen metabolism. We'll look at gut health and um, very convincing clinical trial data on eradicating helicobacter pylori infection. We'll look at immune defences, including a little bit on COVID-19, and we're going to talk about autism, for which there's been some clinical trial data. So epidemiology, to me, is a very powerful starting point from which we can understand the links between diet, disease, and geography. And I discovered a very long time ago that there isn't any one diet that is the optimum diet. There are many different ways of combining foods in order for our biochemistry to function at its peak. We can look at contrasts such as the Okinawan diet that comes out of Japan and compare that with the Mediterranean diet from that region. And we'll soon see that although both of those populations eating that traditional diet are considered to be amongst the healthy and healthiest in the world, what they eat is completely unrelated to the other. We did think for a very long time that nutrition was about macro and micronutrients. And it's only in recent decades that we've really grasped the power of other plant chemicals and the uh, nutrigenomic mechanisms through which they operate. We've known for a long time the power of food in terms of its prevention of chronic disease. But this paper from 2004, I think is particularly interesting. It's simply fruit and vegetable intake and risk of major chronic disease. But look at how little change one has to make in the diet for a profound effect. So what they did is they looked at 100,000 subjects over 10 years, and of the groups they analysed, green leafy vegetable intake showed the strongest inverse association with major chronic disease. And all it took was one extra serving a day to measurably reduce cardiovascular risk. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that with patients. And if we can explain things like this to patients, a lot of people we know don't eat enough green vegetables, they don't eat enough vegetables at all. But if, I think with data like this, we can persuade patients to even just eat one more serve of green leafy vegetables daily to know that there is a beneficial response from that. Not all vegetables are created equal and cruciferous vegetable consumption has been shown for a long time to be associated with a reduced uh, risk of total and cardiovascular disease mortality. And we know that several prospective studies though show no association with total vegetable consumption, but a significant inverse association with cruciferous vegetables. So this plant family does have the edge over a lot of other vegetables. What they pointed out in this study is that they could recommend the need to increase consumption, particularly of cruciferous vegetables and fruit, to promote cardiovascular health and overall longevity. And the reason I'm pointing these things out, because I know the audience know these things, but I want to point out that for a long time, we've not understood what it is about such plants that's really brief is part of the way we can better understand that. Now, if we look at the variety of phytochemicals that are available in the plant foods that we eat, more than 5,000 of these have been identified. And really at this point, we know a little bit about some of them and we know practically nothing about the vast majority of them. It's a huge area of research and so much to learn. You will be familiar with a lot of these categories like the carotenoids, um, the phenolics, alkaloids, nitrogen compounds. And you'll see as we go down the flow chart here, we break up these categories into the most abundant of the plant chemicals, the phenolic acids. Flavonoids you'll be uh, familiar with. Um, 
and then there's a whole lot of subcategories there, which also include the purple pigments, the anthocyanidins. And then we've got another category over here, the organosulfurs. And this is the category which includes the um, broccoli family, which is the isothiocyanates. And they are the um, bioactive chemicals which are in the young germinated seed. So if we're talking about a broccoli sprout, broccoli sprouts contain isothiocyanates, of which sulforaphane is the best known. The mature broccoli contains indoles. You will know that indole 3 carbonyl is sometimes used as a supplement and it then breaks down or dimerizes, I should say, in the gut to or diindolyl methane. So these are compounds found from the mature broccoli, whereas the either thiocyanate comes from the sprout. And then the allylic sulfurs are the ones that come from the onion, garlic, leek family. So the important thing to note here is over on the left here, we've got a molecule of a typical polyphenol. It's a big, bulky molecule. This one is ECGC, which is epigallocatechin gallate from green tea. And this slim little molecule, molecule over here on the right is the sulforaphane. And the shape and the structure of those molecules plays a huge part in their beneficial effects. Very simply, it's this. The polyphenol is a big bulky molecule which has trouble getting through cell membranes. And this is a carotenoid here, a little bit similar. But most of the molecules that you will use in practice like quercetin, gingerol, rutin, a whole range of others, resveratrol, they're all polyphenols and they are all poorly absorbed through membranes. What makes sulforaphane different is because it's a, a, a slender, thin molecule, it's lipophilic, it just glides rapidly through cell membranes and about 80% of that sulforaphane that you consume ends up in your cells, whereas over here, you're lucky if you get 1% or slightly more than that to arrive in your cells. So the structure and the shape of the molecule makes a huge difference. So if we just look historically at how we got where we are in terms of our understanding of antioxidants, I'd just like to point this out. So our initial epidemiological observations have been that diets that are high in fruit and vegetables tend to prevent disease. And in particular, we know that high plant food diets will prevent cancer. So what we did then is we said, okay, that we know that these chronic diseases are associated with oxidative stress. And therefore, if these diseases have a high contributing oxidative stress component, then there must be a role for antioxidants. So we could take one of two paths here. We took this one. And we said then that fruits and vegetables are rich sources of vitamins, many of which are direct acting antioxidants. <clears throat> and we concluded therefore that antioxidant vitamin supplements may protect against cancer. And for 50 or 60 years, we've gone down this path, assuming that vitamin supplements are equivalent in their effect to eating plant food. Now, had we known what we know now back in the 60s and 70s, we could have taken this other path. And this other path says, yes, that's true, but plants contain numerous phytochemicals which are capable of activating the cell's endogenous defences. Therefore, we could really have been looking at the effects of phytochemicals in terms of their chemoprotective action. So that's an interesting story because we've gone completely down this route and since our understanding of nutrigenomics back in the early 2000s, we're now swinging further in this direction. So let's just turn back the clock and see who actually contributed to the fact that we fell in love with antioxidants as we did. 
we go all the way back to 1956 and Dr. Denham Harmon, at the time, he published his work in 1956. He lived from 1916 to 2014. So um, it's intriguing to me that he described the free radical theory of aging. And in fact, he did live to a very ripe old age himself. But he wasn't a nutritionist. He was actually a petrochemical chemist. And it was what he learned in his petrochemical lab about oxidation and reduction and antioxidant actions that made him think, if I could just use these same principles in human health, then perhaps we can slow down the aging process. So that's where it began. And that's where our love affair with antioxidants also began. And it evolved because in the 1970s, Linus Pauling um, published a couple of books, Vitamin C in the Common Cold in 1970, <clears throat> and a few years later, Vitamin C in the Common Cold and the Flu. Now, Linus Pauling, who was uh, a double Nobel laureate, one of those um, Nobel Prizes was a Peace Prize, wasn't a nutritionist either. He had no medical background. He too uh, was a, a pure chemist. However, in his retirement, he turned his hand to this same concept of vitamin C in the common cold. And the rest is history, I guess we would say. Joined together uh, in 1978 with uh, Dr. Ewan Cameron, a Scottish doctor, and they wrote a book on cancer and vitamin C. So again, I was practicing in my early years at this stage and we all got terribly excited about this and, and got caught up in the concept, not realizing at that stage that oral vitamin C and intravenous vitamin C are in fact two totally different um, interventions and they behave quite differently. So all we knew was oral dosing. So began some of the controversies. <clears throat> but then we, we get Further along the track and about 20 years later, the chinks in the antioxidant story as we knew it then began to appear because the carrot study had to actually be stopped 21 months early because some of the participants in the trial were actually dying prematurely. So this was a study where they were giving um, smokers and people exposed to asbestos and ex-smokers high doses of beta carotene, so 30 milligrams of beta carotene, pretty high dose supplementally, and found then after four years of oral supplementation, there was no benefit. But the worrying thing, and this is why they stopped the trial, is that they may have had an adverse effect on the incidence of lung cancer and the risk of death from lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, and any cause in 18,000 um, of these, well, they didn't all have those adverse effects, but enough of them did. There were 388 new cancer, lung cancer cases, which apparently was in excess of the uh, levels anticipated at the time. So the trial was stopped. So that was a real blow to the concept of using antioxidant vitamins as therapy. And then Dharma published this study uh, at a later stage where they'd done a meta-analysis on 65, sorry, 68 randomised trials. That's a pretty large number of participants, almost quarter of a million people in 30 and 100, sorry, 385 different publications. And so what they found is that we did not find convincing evidence that antioxidant supplements have beneficial effects on mortality. And even more beta carotene, vitamin A and vitamin E seem to increase the risk of death. Further randomised trials are needed to establish the effects of vitamin E, of vitamin C and selenium. So to me, that really rocked the boat in terms of having that necessary confidence to go on safely recommending high dosage vitamin supplementation. Uh, then there was a, a diabetes prevention study that again looked at the same concept at 100,000 subjects. They followed them up for 12 years in five different studies. And as you'll see here, each of these large studies 
had no beneficial effect. So I've just highlighted several of them there. So we didn't really understand what was happening um, at this time until about 2009. And this study really illustrates now what's happening, why it's happening, and what we can do to reinterpret what we've been doing in a different context. And that's what I want to um, spend the rest of today talking about. So this was a German study done by a Professor Michael Risto, who still works in this capacity. And what he'd really done is he'd said, okay, we know that exercise is beneficial for health. We know it promotes longevity. We also um, know that a lot of metabolic markers are improved in patients if we can get them exercising. And so what he then did was, he took 20 healthy volunteers and he gave them um, a fairly intensive exercise program. This is uh, two groups. One group was taking a thousand milligrams of vitamin C a day. The other, uh, sorry, and 400 units of vitamin E daily over a month. And the other group continued to do the same exercise, but didn't take any of the supplements. The results of the study were this, as the paper concludes, most importantly, these changes in gene expression and increase in insulin sensitivity after exercise are almost completely abrogated by daily ingestion of antioxidants, vitamin C and E. And so antioxidant supplementation is blocking many of the beneficial effects on metabolism. Now, I remember at the time that paper came out, there was a huge ruckus about it, a huge uproar. How can this be? We've been doing this for years. Why is this happening? The answer lies in nutrigenomics, and it also lies in the way in which cells protect themselves. And before we get into that, we just, uh, this is out of sequence, I apologise. Um, but so we're looking at another study now where we're looking at Similar to the diabetes trial, we took a whole lot of different papers and analysed them all. And we were able to then show that in each of those studies, there was no beneficial effect in preventing uh, cancer, even though we knew that antioxidant uh, diets or diets rich in antioxidant plants were protective against cancer. We found that the antioxidant supplements were not let's try to piece together the story. And we need to classify our antioxidants in order to do that. So the first misconception we've made 60 years ago is to think that what healthy cells need is lots of antioxidants and that we should provide them in every form. What plants actually do, or what human cells actually do, is they produce their own protective compounds. And they're not produced by giving us antioxidants, they're actually produced quite differently. So the most powerful antioxidants in human cells and any animal cell are the antioxidant enzymes. Uh, things like superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and catalase is the three big ones. And they quench literally millions of free radicals or reactive oxygen species per minute. We then have a whole family of detoxification enzymes, glutathione is transferase, quinone reductase, and UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is responsible for glucuronidation. These two families of enzymes combined are the powerhouse of cell protection. That is largely how cells defend themselves. And a few other enzymes. And then there are a range of other enzymes, which are, uh, sorry, other antioxidants within the cell that are not enzymes. They quench one reactive oxygen species per molecule, whereas the enzymes, it's millions per molecule. Glutathione is one. Our cells make their own glutathione. They make their own coenzyme Q10, lipoic acid, thyroidoxin, uric acid, bilirubin, and others. 
So these are all the antioxidant type compounds that our cells make for themselves. Now, in addition to that, we have the exogenous vitamins like ascorbate and tocopherols that we've just talked about, which also act on the cell but are not produced within the cell. We have long chain phytochemicals like beta carotene, lutein and lycopene from tomatoes. We also have polyphenols like the ones from green tea, cucumin, olives, pomegranate and so on. And then what we have are the nutrigenomically active molecules. And what these do is these, so sulforaphane is in this category, these send signals to the cellular machinery to activate the production of these antioxidant and detoxification enzymes. So in nature, if we weren't to get involved at all, what nature does is nature provides us with a huge array of different plant foods. Let's suppose we're eating the perfect diet with lots and lots of plant foods. Our diets then would contain large quantities of these nutrigenomically active molecules, which are then switching on the mechanisms that produce all of these protective compounds. The other thing that's interesting is when we exercise, we're doing exactly the same thing. Exercise is doing what nutrigenomically active molecules do. Exercise switches on these protective enzymes as well. We'll come back to that. So we call this the antioxidant paradox because when we want to achieve antioxidant defences within the cell, we don't use antioxidants to achieve that, we use pro-oxidants. And you're going, what? What do you mean? How can you use a pro-oxidant? The reason for that is the cell responds to stress signals from the environment and a pro-oxidant molecule is a stress signal. It's the same way that exercise is a stress signal. And when the cell recognises it's under stress, that's the switch that switches on its own defences. And so in the past few years, probably 15 years or so now, I would say, we've now witnessed an acceleration in our knowledge base in understanding how these natural redox responses are coming about within cells to restore their healthy balance. And we do it with weak pro-oxidants, not with antioxidants. So it's certainly a point to ponder this apparent paradox. And so cellular defense systems are activated by free radicals and actually inhibited by antioxidants. Save your questions up for that one. When I started looking at nutrigenomics in 2004, I had a background in biochemistry and a background in nutrition. I knew very little about genomics, apart from the, the fundamentals that you learn in a, a science course. And so I soon realized that if I could combine what I knew about nutrition and biochemistry uh, with what I had to learn about genomics and later nutrigenomics, I had a wonderful combination of background science for understanding a lot more about human health than I'd ever known when I was in practice. I didn't learn any of this until I'd left clinical practice. And so it's really nutrigenomics now that's driving the paradigm shift in the practice of nutritional medicine. And this is the added dimension to personalised medicine. I'm sure some of you in the um, audience are already skilled in interpreting nutrigenomic tests and probably in using nutrigenomic interventions. But it's a big jump to come from here to have to learn a whole lot of new sciences just as it is uh, a big jump for a geneticist who's skilled in genomics to have to come over to this side and learn all these other skills. So that's the power of learning uh, the new sciences of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics formally, because to me, it's opened up a whole new world. And if I was still in practice, I would be practicing quite differently from what I was when I was in clinic. 
So really what we're doing is we are clinically looking at the impact of new science that's overlaid on top of our old science. And it's just a wonderful dimension and it just changes so many things. Earlier in this presentation, I mentioned the idea that we talked about biochemical individuality and we thought we were pretty flash because we had this wonderful term, but even though we didn't really know what it meant, how to measure it or what to do about it. So I want to use the example of alcohol dehydrogenase as an enzyme with, with which we can nutrigenomically intervene. First of all, that's what the enzyme looks like. Uh, here's the, the APO enzyme, which is the 3D amino acid structure. Here's the catalytic site where it's the docking station for the substrate, in this case, alcohol. Uh, we've got several zinc ions, which act as cofactors. And we've got vitamin B3 in the form of NAD, which acts as the coenzyme. So that's what our alcohol dehydrogenase molecule looks like. What do I mean by nutrigenomic activation? So if I've got ethanol now in my cytosol, what my body is going to need to break this down is to use the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase along with its zinc and B3. I'm going to convert that ethanol now to acetaldehyde, which is even more toxic than alcohol itself. And it's the acetaldehyde which gives you the hangover and all of the, the nasty side effects. And interestingly too, we have another enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase, which very conveniently uses zinc and B3 as its same coenzyme and same cofactors. So once I get through there, I now have acetate, which goes through the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle's now gonna turn this acetate into ATP and some waste products. So that's how I normally metabolize alcohol. So how can I intervene nutrigenomically? Well, there's three things that I can do. First of all, I can increase the substrate availability, and I'm not suggesting you do this, because the more alcohol you consume, the greater the substrate, the more your body learns to produce more of these two enzymes. This is why an alcoholic often will be drinking huge quantities of alcohol every day, but not appear intoxicated. They have increased their substrate availability and therefore the gene expression of these two enzymes has increased substantially. So that's nature's inbuilt mechanism. The other thing we can do, and this is what we were doing in the 70s, this is what the megavitamin era was really all about. We then would give large doses, very large doses of zinc and vitamin B3 in order to drive these enzyme reactions to completion. And that's because these enzymes are never operating at their maximum potential. We can always get a bit more work out of them. So that's what we were doing in order to maximise enzyme reactions, not just in these reactions, but many, many enzymes. This was our approach. But now we can do something quite different. We can turn up the expression of these two enzymes. And I'll show you in a minute how we use sulforaphane to upregulate both alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase through NRF2 activity. And quite interestingly, both of these enzymes are NRF2 target genes so that when you switch on one, you also switch on the other. But it's also about how a weak prooxidant like sulforaphane can upregulate cellular defenses because sulforaphane is actually weakly prooxidant. And that seems such an anomaly when you think, I'm trying to get some antioxidant defenses in my cells. Why on earth do I want something that's prooxidant? So sulforaphane, in fact, is the most potent plant-derived inducer of NRF2, which is the key to activating cellular defenses. Now, where does the sulforaphane story begin? Well, it begins back in the 1990s uh, at Johns Hopkins University, and this is in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Paul Talalay, who died just last year, was the pioneer of 
this research and he published this paper that looks at this broccoli sprout material where he found it was a major inducer of the anti-carcinogenic protective enzymes. So he'd isolated this compound and he'd worked out what it looked like structurally. We didn't have the words nutrigenomics at that time and we didn't even know what NRF2 was. So this is kind of where he started back here in 1992, published that first paper. And you can see this is the number of papers published every year on sulforaphane. And my data only go to 2018. However, you can see there's a steady increase over time. And I got involved back here when there were only about 40 papers a year. So I've watched this huge amount of research being published over that time. How do you get sulforaphane? Because I'm going to tell you that even though, so this is what broccoli sprouts look like, even though broccoli sprouts are the highest source of sulforaphane, there is actually no sulforaphane in the sprouts. What is in the sprouts, in fact, is an inactive precursor and an enzyme called morosinase. And this morosinase enzyme then acts on this precursor glucoraphanin and produces the sulforaphane. Now that only happens when you cut it or chew it or bite it. And that's because there's little sacs within the plant cell. So the glucoraphanin is in a little sac within the plant cell and the morosinase in is, is in a separate sac and they don't get together until you break up the structure of the plant. Once you do that, this morosinase enzyme acts very quickly to produce sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is a very unstable molecule. So even if you could make it um, in some method in the lab, it's very difficult to protect it for more than about half an hour or so. So you have to make it as you go. So if you're using a high quality broccoli sprout supplement, you would want to make sure you don't get water on that supplement until you're ready to take it. As soon as it gets wet, the morosinase acts on the precursor and you produce it as you're swallowing it. Very clever. And um, the problem is, if you've got a supplement that's got no morosinase, then you're going to end up with no sulforaphane. And a lot of the supplements, as I'll show you later, actually are very short um, in morosinase. In fact, the manufacturers deliberately deactivate them when they produce them. So there is no morosinase. They will tell you they're relying on the morosinase-like activity of the gut microflora, which is less than 10% of what you're going to get from the intact supplement. So there's a lot to understand in terms of achieving what you want to achieve here. So sulforaphane is a potent inducer of chemoprotective compounds. This is a, another study that came out from the Johns Hopkins Research Group and it looks at the induction of phase two detox enzyme, especially one called quinone reductase. Now, I think in nutritional medicine, we talk a lot about phase two detox pathways, but we seldom talk about quinone reductase. And quinone reductase, in my opinion, is the best kept secret in nutritional medicine because it is the very last enzyme that stops toxic metabolites from damaging DNA and causing uh, mutagenesis in the cells. And in session two next week, we are going to go into estrogen detoxification in some detail. And I'm going to show you how this quinone reductase fits into the picture and how if you're not talking about quinone reductase, you're really missing the story. So what this paper also shows is that sprouts of many broccoli cultivars contain negligible quantities of indoles, which predominate in the mature broccoli vegetable and may give rise to degradation products such as indole three carbonyl that can enhance tumorigenesis. Now that might surprise you because I know there are many who advocate the use of I3C as a supplement, but I think the Evidence is somewhat doubtful, and to me, it's something for which we need to be fairly cautious, but we'll come back to that next week. The thing to really note here is that it's the sprouts that are really 
concentrated in their ability to produce sulforaphane, not the mature vegetable. Whereas the I3C is found in very small quantities in the mature vegetable. And in fact, the quantities of I3C in common supplements is hundred times more than you can get from eating the vegetable anyway. And it's synthetically manufactured. I3C is not made from broccoli. It's, it's a lab manufactured molecule. So we say here that broccoli sprouts are 20 to 100 times more concentrated uh, in the sprout than the mature vegetable. And the reason that I have to be vague about that is that broccoli sprouts, uh, broccoli seeds vary 16 fold in the content of the precursor glucoraphanate. And so when you're going to sprout your own, you've got no way of knowing whether you've bought a seed that's going to produce a high level of sulforaphane or a low level of sulforaphane. So that makes it a little bit difficult. So, but I, what I usually say to people is, if you're looking for a therapeutic response, you better to look for a supplement for which we know the quantity of sulforaphane yield. But if you want to look for general nutrition and you want to add a lovely fresh green leafy vegetable to your diet, nothing wrong with eating plenty of sprouts. You can even do both. So if we just go back to our NRF2 target genes in alcohol detoxification, we see that these two target genes here are part of the um, aldehol, alcohol detoxification process, but so too is quinone reductase. And the beauty of using NRF2 activation is when you're switching on your genes for alcohol detoxification, you're switching on quinone reductase, which is your anti-cancer or your anti-DNA mutagenesis gene as well. So NRF2 is largely the key to our cellular defences. And what we see is that we've got a whole host of different foods. The more plant foods we eat, the better. Uh, and all of those have got a range of different bioactives. Most of them will have some ability to activate NRF2 as a switch in the cell. Although sulforaphane is by far the, the highest level, all of these will be contributing. So the more plant food we eat, the better it's going to be, and the greater our ability to produce these signals that activate gene expression. How cells defend themselves? Well, as I said earlier, we have the ability to detect stressors in the environment, and that's what activates our cell defences. So whether that stressor is radiation or air pollution or toxic environmental chemicals, or whether it's distresses from aberrant metabolism internally, the body registers those potential cell damaging signals. And that's what activates gene expression and enables us now to produce hundreds of different protective enzymes. Some research that comes um, out of various places around the world, looks at this concept that NRF2 is probably a multi-organ protector because what's happening in one cell is happening in every cell of the body. If you want to defend cells and give them their best defense capacity, NRF2 activation is the way to achieve that. And so what this researcher says is NRF2 may serve as the master regulator of the cell defense system against oxidative stress and protects many cell types and organ systems from a broad, broad spectrum of toxic insults and disease pathogenesis. And Professor Yongjun So from Korea has been one of the most remarkable of the NRF2 researchers in talking about NRF2 as a master redox switch in turning on the cellular signaling involved in the induction of cytoprotective genes by some chemoprotective chemicals. So you see, we're no longer talking about the need to increase antioxidants, but we do talk about the need to use anti or to look at cellular signaling in order to enhance cellular defenses. So it's just a different way of looking at the same thing. And the last thing I want to say in relation to NRF2 is that it's been widely researched now in terms of ageing. 
And Caitlin Lewis is an interesting researcher. If you followed at all the resveratrol research that was done some years ago, um, the um, research group eventually sold off their resveratrol to GlaxoSmith and Klein for $720 million, which is rather interesting. Uh, that was done, that research was done by David Sinclair, who I'm proud to say is an Australian scientist who went to Harvard University to do this research. But the interesting point is that Caitlin Lewis, who was left behind in the lab after his departure, was then focusing on NRF2 instead of resveratrol and looking at it as the guardian of health span and gatekeeper of species longevity. So that's her determination of species longevity saying that this pathway may indeed be the master regulator of the aging process. And that's back over to you again, Anne Catherine. I was leaning back and then really enjoying this elegant presentation that you have uh, done. So thank you very much, Christine. So of course, there's been questions on the side. Um, and some of them I'm going to read up just to make sure that I don't interpret the question and then present it in a wrong way for you. So one question goes, what your opinion is about the bioavailability of these bioactives with the usage of, let me just see, the raw broccoli seeds, for example, mixing it in a smoothie. So does, so when you take the supplements and put it into a smoothie, does that impact it or make it better? And I guess you can talk for both. Yes, yeah, so when, when we started Cell Logic, our first product was just a broccoli sprout powder, not a seed powder. That's a different thing altogether. Seeds actually do contain a toxic compound called erucic acid. So we don't use seeds, we use young sprouts. But as soon as that powder gets wet, that's what sets off the activation. If it's a capsule, as soon as that gets wet in the stomach and the capsule's disintegrated, then you get the activation. So uh, the problem with the broccoli seed extracts, which are largely what's coming out of the US, is they are uh, devoid of the morosinase enzyme. So you can mix them in a smoothie if you want, but without that enzyme, it doesn't make any difference if that's what the question was. Super. So, um, and of course I'm sitting with uh, some products here that are that you will find. Broccolox is the one that you all know from VMS uh, that we've been talking about when you, when you log into VMS. I'm going to send you information about that as well. And that comes in both capsules and uh, powder. And that's, uh, that has the active myrosinase in it. I, a question came up uh, earlier. So then uh, Susanne is asking um, in regards to upregulating of, of NERV2, um, can we then upregulate other SNPs involved in the oxidative stress defense systems, CAT, GPX1, MNSOT, even if some of these are dysfunctional? Well, when you have SNPs, uh, yes, you already have an enzyme or a gene that's not functioning at its peak. But as I said in relation to the alcohol dehydrogenase, um, there's always some spare capacity in there. It's like you're driving your car and you're only have your foot on the accelerator to go 80 kilometers an hour. But if you pushed harder, you could go higher. I think your speed limits are higher than ours anyway, as are about 100. Um, and the, the genes are like that too. So if you've got SNPs, it's like, it's only comfortable to drive at 80 k's an hour. But if you can activate gene expression through NRF2, uh, then it's like you were putting your foot harder on the accelerator and you could actually go faster. So it's a little bit like that. And that's the whole point of using this nutrigenomic activation is that we can um, increase the activity of these enzymes. One of the common ones um, that we look at clinically is the vitamin D receptors, the VDR. Lots of people carry SNPs on VDR. And if you and we find those are the patients where they have to keep taking higher and higher levels of vitamin D supplement in order to register in the normal range on their, their blood profile. 
But you find that if you upregulate the vitamin D receptors using sulforaphane at the right dose, you find that demand for extra vitamin D just completely disappears. So we discovered that, I, I, I just, we largely discovered that by accident. There's one obscure paper that gave me the clue to look for it. And then we started talking to clinicians here in Australia and New Zealand. And they started trialing this and we found that, yes, that's true. That definitely happens. So it's possibly a, a use for sulforaphane that you may not have been aware of, Anne Catherine. Yeah, for sure, because we had uh, some weeks ago, we had uh, Miguel, my very good colleague, uh, talking about the CREMA protocol and all the vitamin D protocol in regards to autoimmune uh, conditions. So that's, mm -hmm. that. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna nudge him and say that uh, we need to look a little bit on, on this because if we can upregulate mm -hmm. the vitamin D receptors and downregulate the autoimmune response, um, that's, that's just um, mm -hmm. amazing. So, but then you said, uh, you, you touch the amount like of dosage and what is what, what is, so so what would you suggest that uh, the dosage is one thing is in food and then on top of the food uh, what would you dosage well, the box box with if, would you mind if we left that till next week because what I want to do is I want to look at the available clinical trials on sulforaphane we know the dose they used in those clinical trials and I want to show you how we can match that dose because that's that's what we've done in developing. Um, we have something we call the GEM protocol here in Australia, gut ecology and metabolic modulation. We've been guided by the doses in the available clinical trials in order to provide that dosing for our patients. And we know that putting it into practice that way it works. So if I can explore that next week with you, I think it'll be a much better answer to your question. That's absolutely no problem at all. And just wanted to say that we are actually been 90 people, a lot more than I thought we would put together here and oh, this, uh, this morning in Europe. So uh, that's been very, very good. So yeah, we will uh, keep the excitement for next uh, next uh, week when we go into the clinical side of, of um, mm -hmm. so forth act my mm -hmm. and so on so until next time i guess uh, we just have to eat a lot of um, um cabbage <laughs> and so on and uh, okay. if we have some parkolox at home we can take a couple of capsules or a scoop and <laughs> add it into the smoothie i had my smoothie whilst you were talking so um one person actually mentioned this uh and i'm just gonna bring it up and and you may not have comments to it but it was just because it was in a comment and it's more like the carnivore diet um mm -hmm. where it's, it, it's, it sounds like um a fifa has been uh doing a lot of research into only like meat eating diet and how that actually has been, well, show some health benefits. But have you been studying that in regards to all this uh, as well? I, looking look, into I, I have to some extent. Um, I've, I've been looking at it in terms of the microbiome because that's an interesting exercise. But I also looked at it some time ago in terms of the ketogenic diet, which is not the same as carnivore, I know, but it's, it's a different concept and you might be interested to know that ketogenesis actually has an nrf2 activating capacity so i spent some time a few years ago looking at epilepsy and, and saying why does a ketogenic diet benefit an epileptic what i discovered was it's the nrf2 activation so if you have epileptic patients why not look at giving them sulforaphane as a different way of activating those same pathways. And um, I'm, I'm not terribly comfortable with a carnivore diet in terms of not using plants. I mean, to me, the epidemiological evidence over thousands of years, I guess, is that the healthiest populations on the planet do eat lots of plant food. The Mediterraneans, eat lots of plant food in their classical diet, largely because the people couldn't afford meat. And so they had to learn to use legumes and cheap various bits and pieces of things they could grow. And so that's the origin of the Mediterranean diet. But that high plant food diet talks to me more than a carnivore diet. I, I couldn't imagine um, well, having see, a carnivore diet exclusively. It's very yeah. boring too, and I like to cook. 
<laughs> we like the vegetables. But anyway, Afifa was also humble enough to uh, mention the carnivore diet as a black swan. So I guess we will find out <laughs> in times, maybe in yeah, mm -hmm. ten years or whatever. But uh, so it's an it's an interesting concept, and it it goes a little bit against each other. And, and well, um, I've followed Paul Saladino a fair bit. I mean, he's the one who's talking about carnivore diets such a lot. And um, there are, when you start looking at the gut microbiome and you look at the short chain fatty acids that are essential for good gut immune health, there is, there is some biochemistry that can explain how the carnivore diet can achieve some of what you do with um, prebiotics and short chain fatty acids, but maybe we're getting a bit off the track of why we're here. <laughs> Of course, we are. It's, but we are, we are a community here and we are open for, for new things. And so oh, it's, so it's all okay. Topics. We get a little bit track sided. It's yeah. okay. But anyway, um, we will send out uh, the recordings as soon as um, uh, yeah, IT allows. And um, then please go in in the newsletters and we will send out an invitation again and make sure you sign up for next week because Christine will yeah, be with us next Thursday again. And if you're mm -hmm. excited in, in, the, in, in between, you can always uh, order some supplements in your um, practitioner profile. And uh, yeah, otherwise I just have to say to you, Christine, that was an excellent, excellent talk and Thank introduction you. for next week. And I'm very excited to, to uh, be with you next week as well and, and dig more into my, where my heart is, the clinical side. How do we help our patients and how do we make them feel more comfortable and how do we uh, support longevity and so on. So um, yeah, that's going to be exciting. So next time, uh, same place, uh, 10 o'clock, same time as well. Thank you all and thank you all for staying tuned and thank you so much for spending some of your precious uh, Thursday morning times with us. And Virtual thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine.